Hello everyone, my name is Pixel Rifts and welcome back to the Minecraft Survival Guide. I hope you're all having a good day. In today's episode, we're going to continue work on the Guardian farm that we started in the previous episode. And today we'll have a focus on how to extract all of the water from this cylinder of white concrete that we built around the Guardian farm in the previous episode. Our perimeter is done, but how on earth are we going to dry this entire thing out when there are guardians swimming around it constantly and the area of open water we're dealing with is pretty intense. I'm actually going to fly over to the other side of this circle so I can sleep, because it is always better to discuss this kind of stuff in the daytime. And while the monument itself has given us plenty of supplies for drying out areas of water in the form of the sponges, which when we place them in water will basically draw a bunch of water into them and will <laughs> clear out quite a large area of water, that's not so easy when it comes to large open areas of water like this because of the way Minecraft's water physics work. If I place a sponge right here, it drains a large area, but then the water rushes back in to fill it back up. And what I'm left with is a wet sponge and not a great deal of progress. The reason for that, of course, is the way Minecraft forms water sources. If there are two water sources at a diagonal, then they will fill in the blocks immediately adjacent to them. And what's happening here is that all of the areas that the sponge is dried out have those large open areas of water next to them, which can just reform water source blocks immediately once the block has been taken away. Once the sponge has been removed or once the water has gone, it basically comes right back in. So there are a couple of different ways that we can get around that by filling up this area with a certain amount of blocks, which are either going to divide up this area into sections where the water cannot come flooding back in, or are going to fill up this area with a different type of material material entirely. And if you haven't found an ocean monument which contains sponges, I highly recommend going out and raiding another one. Even if you don't plan on turning it into the eventual guardian farm, if the one that you started your guardian farm at does not have any sponges, I recommend going out raiding another ocean monument just to find a couple of sponge rooms because I have a stack of sponges right here. That's probably all I'll need for this project, but Having at least that many sponges is usually a good idea if you're taking on a project of this size and you want to drain this amount of water. It just makes sense to have them. Of course, if you want to drain the inside of the monument, it's a slightly different story because the inside of the monument is already divided up into different sets of rooms, which if we grab a couple of blocks and we just block off the door right here, we could place a sponge in the middle of this room and the entire thing more or less immediately dries out. We can throw a couple of blocks of sand in the corners here to get rid of the remaining water source blocks, spam it with torches or sponges or anything else, and what we're left with is pretty much an instantly dry room with just a single sponge used. So inside the monument it's not all that bad. And with the conduit we've got set up in here, we don't really need to worry too much about water breathing or anything like that. We will still need to worry about the guardians, but it, honestly you can probably chug another invisibility potion or two and swim around the monument, clearing it out that way. But today we're going to approach a couple of different methods which will also help us drain the perimeter around the outside here and make it a lot harder for guardians to spawn here to remove all of the water and to set up the guardian farm how we want it. And I think one of the first things I'm going to do is move our nether portal out closer to the guardian farm itself because honestly it's going to be easier if we can go back and forth to the nether in a more convenient fashion. Mostly because we want to get back and forth to our base to pick up a couple of useful supplies, but also because the nether allows us to instantly dry sponges. And when we've got large amounts of sponges, it's going to be nice and easy to dry these off in the nether instead of waiting for them to all dry in a furnace. So we're going to break down this portal and move it over to where the ocean monument is. Hopefully we shouldn't have any issues connecting it back up. It might even link to the same portal in the nether. And if it doesn't, it should only be a few blocks away. So we've got a little grass platform on this side. We're actually going to stick our nether portal onto the side of that because the platform here is also going to be host to a couple of devices that are going to make it easier for us to clear out some of this area. First of all, we're going to set up two chests on either side here. We're going to direct some hoppers into them, and on one side we're going to put a double composter, and on the other side we're going to put a double smoker. We'll put some hoppers going into these, and we'll come back with enough wood for some input chests for each of those, because we're going to put a couple of things in each of these. First of all, we're going to need to get rid of all of the kelp and seagrass that is down here, because 
whatever method we use to clear out the water, the kelp and seagrass is going to get in the way. Seagrass will just be destroyed when you break it with your hand, but kelp will of course float to the surface, and we might as well make use of some of that kelp, either by putting it in a smoker so that we can cook it twice as fast because it is a food, so we can actually cook it in a smoker, and that will create a bunch of dried kelp that we can turn into kelp blocks or eat as a snack. Kelp can also be composted, although in terms of the composter, we're actually going to be doing something a little different with that, and I'm going to throw some bone blocks in here for now because we all need to bone meal a bunch of stuff a little bit later. But if we divide the kelp up that I've already collected from messing around with this ocean monument, you'll notice that it smelts super fast, and once we end up with dried kelp here in the output, nine of this can be converted into a kelp block, which are quite unique looking blocks, and might be kind of cool to have around. In a future episode, we're going to make a kelp farm so that you can make as many of these blocks as you want to, but for the moment, I think it's going to be nice to smoke all of the kelp that we have here in this perimeter, and that will give us something useful to do with it all. Anyway, while we're at it, let's check that this portal connects to the other nether portal that we've already got in the nether, which it doesn't seem to, but our other portal should be, uh, yeah, right over there, so really, really close by. Nothing to worry about there. Uh, give or take this canyon of lava in the Soul Sand Valley, which I think we all need to bridge across. We'll come back a little later if we want to make this safer. <laughs> but in the meantime, our old portal seems to connect to a lush cave underneath that area, so um, <laughs> that's kind of cool, I guess. We're also at Y-35, which is such a weird place to be, considering how high up we were in the nether. I'm uh, really surprised that that portal didn't leave us somewhere on the surface, but eh, never mind. What we're going to do in the meantime is fly back through the nether hub to the Dripstone Cave Base, which contains some supplies that I think we're going to use for one of our water clearing methods today. And they are right over here. We can potentially use Warped and Crimson Fungus, or the large Warped and Crimson Fungus at least, to drain out the areas of water inside and outside the Ocean Monument, for which we are going to need at least a stack of the corresponding Nylium for each type of fungus, but that's nice and easy to gather if you know where the biomes are. Alright, I think we have everything we need. Meet me back over at the Ocean Monument and we'll get started. So, as I mentioned, one of the first things we're going to do is swim around the perimeter of the Ocean Monument, clearing out any water foliage that is down there. Any plant life has to go, so seagrass and kelp both have to go in this case. We're going to drink another potion of invisibility so that the guardians don't attack us, remove everything but the Depth Strider boots, which is going to keep us maneuverable down there. We're just going to hop in and do the thing. It's going to take a little while to clear all of this stuff out, but it's going to be worth it in the long run. And of course, if you want to bring down some shears so that you can collect the seagrass for whatever turtle breeding project you have going on, or just for decoration elsewhere in your world, you can bring that too, but it's usually pretty easy to get seagrass just by bone mealing it, so I don't tend to worry about that stuff. One of the reasons we're getting rid of this underwater foliage is because one of the main methods we're going to use to create like individual sections here that we can dry out using sponges is by placing sand from the top down. And while sand will break seagrass, if I place a block of sand there, it is going to break the seagrass as it hits the bottom down here. Sand will actually break on top of kelp, and that's a problem because kelp is going to be all over the place down here, and you want to make sure that the sand blocks that you drop will make it to the bottom and form a pillar. And while breaking the seagrass up here might not be super necessary, sometimes it can be hiding kelp plants. Like if a piece of kelp is growing like there, for example, you don't always notice it amongst the tall seagrass. So I recommend clearing the seagrass out as well. Not necessary mechanically, but pretty necessary so that you can eyeball it and see where the kelp is still growing. As the kelp all floats to the surface, we are going to swim around and collect it. You could do this in a boat as well, which is probably slightly faster, and there's no real need to collect all this kelp. You could let it despawn if you want to, but kelp blocks are also kind of useful as furnace fuels, so we can potentially do something cool with those a little bit later. At the very least, we can turn the dried kelp we've made so far into kelp blocks. We can put that in the fuel slot of these two smokers, and now we can use those to smelt 20 kelp each, which is honestly not too bad. <laughs> it makes for a pretty useful fuel source. Anyway, we're just about done removing all of the kelp from around here. I'm going to quickly run around and check that the seagrass isn't hiding any more of it, so we'll probably remove some of the seagrass as well, but my first invisibility potion is about to run out, so realistically it only took us about five minutes to get rid of all of the kelp here. But with kelp gone from the majority of the monument, now it's time to start moving on to our first clearing phase, which is going to be using sand blocks to section off areas of the monument into small enough areas that can be dried out with sponges. Now the typical way of doing this, as you might imagine, is to stand on the edge of a block and simply place sand so that it falls down to the sea floor, and then you just move over one block, keep placing sand there, occasionally get hit by guardians and have to hide, and this whole method is going to take a little while. What we can do is speed this whole process up using a little bit of redstone, and while we might want a regular piston for this, a sticky piston should do just fine for what I have in mind here. We're going to place a block here and a block here, they don't have to be note blocks, these are just 
solid blocks that I had on hand. I could make a couple of kelp blocks and do that, I suppose. Oh, wait a minute. We are going to need a regular piston for this. Be right back. Okay, so returning with a regular piston, we want to place that facing this way so that it's going to push sand over the edge of where we already have some sand placed. We're going to put a repeater facing into this block with a power source behind it. Could be a block with a lever on it. Could be a redstone block, whatever you've got to hand, really. We're going to place one redstone dust there and a solid block next to the piston here. And now whenever we place sand in front of this, it's going to be pushed over the edge. So we can effectively allow the piston to push sand this way for us. And by holding down right click, we place a sand block there more or less every time the piston retracts, meaning that we can fill up a large area pretty quickly. If you wanted to, you could even go one step further and fill up a dispenser full of sand, which would activate every time this circuit activates as well, meaning that as you place the sand here, your <laughs> inventory is constantly being refilled with blocks of sand from the dispenser. It might be a little noisy, but in the end, this method is vastly more time efficient than crouching, looking at the side of a block, and right clicking the sand into place. Now naturally the only problem with this method is the 12 block piston push limit. At that stage we will have to relocate the piston pusher somewhere a little further out and that's where we're going to start to run into problems with guardians and why I've brought enough invisibility potions that those can last a little while. You're also going to find yourself running out of sand pretty quickly because in this case we've used a one row of a shelker box plus a little bit extra and given that our circle is 82 blocks across we are probably less than one sixth of the way over here because we've only gone 12 blocks in. So it's going to take a fair amount of sand, I would say. But what we're going to do is count one, two, three, four blocks along, and our next row of sand is going to start placing right here. We're going to have the same setup as we had before with our piston facing that way. There we go. That's going to drop the sand down there for us. We're going to stash a few stacks of sand in the dispenser here, and we're just going to have the dispenser supply us with sand for the next row. But at this stage, we can move our piston pushing contraption four blocks around the side of the circle and start to cross these lines over so they form a grid. Then what we'll be left with is these 4x4 areas of water, which is pretty easy to dry out with a couple of well-placed sponges. You might want to bring a stack or two of scaffolding along with you so that you can retrieve the sponges at the end of all this, because honestly it's a bit of a pain getting hold of them from higher up on the wall. But after that, we are left with an isolated area of empty air where there was previously water. And this is what we're going to do for a large expanse of this ocean monument. We're probably going to do about half of it this way just to get rid of the water using sponges, which once again, we're going to dry out nice and easily simply by returning to the nether and placing them. Now we're going to put the sand draining method on hold for now so that I can talk about the other method that we had in mind. And the reason we went back to the dripstone cave to gather up all of this crimson and warped nilium and a handful of the crimson and warped fungus because we are about to try draining some of this monument using nether trees. I'm going to bring a few sand blocks as well, but any blocks will do here just to make sure that we can cordon off an area down there and make sure it is completely dry. And we're going to chug another invisibility potion because the guardians are clearly on to me at this point. Now down here in the depths of the monument, we have a decent layer actually here where we can probably block this off. We're going to swim into this area underneath the pillars of the monument. We're going to close all of this off and then we're going to drop a sponge so that we clear this area of water and give ourselves a bit of space to work. Let's put one sponge here, and that's most of the room cleared out. And down here underneath this section of the monument, for demonstration purposes, we're going to start a small nether wood farm. We're just going to space things out, maybe leave a couple of blocks in between each of these trees so that they have a little bit of room to grow, and so that the foliage on the top, the nether warp blocks that generate are going to have a little bit of room to intermingle up there. We could plant all of these trees side by side on blocks of nilium immediately adjacent to each other, but I'm not going to do that quite yet. Instead, we're just going to plant them on alternating blocks like this, and then we're going to grab a bunch of bone meal. And now, down here underneath the monument, even though we have prismarine blocks directly overhead, we're going to start spamming some of these crimson fungus with bone meal. And in defiance of conventional tree growing, they will have absolutely no problem growing up through the prismarine blocks because one aspect of nether trees which goes largely unappreciated is their ability to grow upwards through other blocks. Now that doesn't always mean they have replaced the blocks above them because as you can see here where we grew a nether tree it hasn't replaced the prismarine blocks. It has however replaced the blocks above them that were previously filled with water. And now if we return to the tank here so that we can take a look you'll see that a pretty large area right here has been taken up with nether foliage. The crimson trees have grown up through the structure of the ocean monument and have left a bunch 
of nether warp blocks around the outside. So the nether trees will grow and fill any air blocks, they will also grow to fill water blocks, and these are the only types of trees that will do something like this. And so, in theory, we could take a bunch of the nether trees and use them to gradually fill this entire area with nether foliage. Any additional trees grown adjacent to these will probably grow in some nether warp blocks to fill in the gaps. And then, what remaining gaps of water we have, like in here for example, where there's clearly a couple of blocks inside of there, those we can come through after and use sponges to clear out the remaining water sources. Now naturally this is the kind of work that is best undertaken from the bottom upwards. It can present a bit of a problem trying to grow these nether trees around water because while we can place some crimson nylium in water, we unfortunately cannot place a crimson fungus on top of it without it getting swept away by the water flowing back into the space where it was just placed. And so it's going to be necessary to dry out any areas that we want to place the crimson or warped fungus before we grow them up through the floor of the monument and into the area above. All we need to do is cut down the majority of these from below until we end up with a solid floor of nether warp blocks and at that point we can start growing a second layer up through the first layer and continue to replace all of the blocks above with nether warts. So I think for this monument we're going to do a bit of a half and half approach. We're going to spend half of our effort on this side doing the sand method where we end up boxing it off into areas like this and we'll try and drain the other half using the nether foliage method which might take a little bit longer but it is a possibility if you don't want to go digging this much sand or you don't have any sponges available to you. It's also a neat way of farming the nether wood if you don't have too much of that, and the nether wart blocks can be thrown into the composter here once they are ready to be removed, allowing us to get more bone meal that can make the operation a bit more self-sustaining. Well, there's no time like the present, and no other ways to get this done right now, so I think we're going to spend a lot of time draining the exterior of this ocean monument, and we're going to do that in the form of a time lapse. <laughs> Thank you. 
Hey folks, welcome back. I hope you enjoyed the time lapse. I'm not certain the time lapse is entirely done yet, and we're certainly not done with this area. I'll flip back to the camera account very quickly so we can see where I'm at right now. We've probably got a quarter of this all boxed off, and there's a certain amount of this that I've dried out already, but I wanted to pop back in to show you folks what I've learned because I've been learning a little bit about this process and I've heard for a while this was more of a hearsay thing than something that I tested in creative or anything and figured out that this was going to be a worthwhile thing. I've heard a lot of people say yeah if you're using uh, you know warped and crimson trees to you know clear out an ocean monument that's a really smart way to do it if you don't have sponges and what I'm learning is that it's not great for drying out perimeters like this what it is probably the best for is drying out individual rooms of the monument. Let's see if I can remember which box has the entrance in it so that I can dive right down and I can show you from inside the monument what is happening here. Yeah, I think I'll probably be able to swim in this way. I can just sneak under the canopy. Yep, there we go, and we're in. Thankfully, conduit power still active, so I can show you what's up. So if we come through here, this area has been effectively cordoned off by all of the warped foliage growing, and there are still occasional pockets of water here and there. I should have brought my hoe with me so that we could actually, you know, mine this stuff out more effectively, but I sort of don't want to disturb too much of this yet. The idea being that if we fill up the entirety of the monument from below with these warp trees, it does make it a little bit easier to clear out, and some of them grow high enough that they will actually grow up through the center of the monument. It hasn't happened in this case, but the conduit is right there, and I've actually been avoiding growing stuff too close to the conduit just in case we lose conduit power. The conduit itself won't end up being replaced by the blocks of the warp tree, but the water spaces around it might, and that's what the conduit needs to actually stay active, so I've been trying to avoid that. But realistically, it seems like sand is going to be the most potent way of getting rid of all of this stuff. Sand and sponges, really, because I still have a full stack of sponges. I've been drying them out in the nether every so often, and we have dried out and removed the sand from each of these areas where you can see the edges of the monument are starting to come through. And I think I really favor this systematic, organized approach over what we've been doing with the warped and crimson trees. Diving on back down here, if I fly through the wall, or I, it feels like flying, honestly, when you are, when you've got conduit power and you can see it really well underwater. But this entire field was warped and crimson nilium. I grew the trees up through the bottom of the, the monument right here. And that's been relatively easy to do, but still a little bit fiddly, kind of time consuming and just kind of growing the trees in rows like this took a little bit of time. Not that the sand placement hasn't taken too much time, but the time is spent really focusing on what you're doing. Whereas with sand, especially if you've automated the process with pistons, it's something that you can kind of switch your brain off and just do on autopilot. If you've got like a vague sense of where you need to place the sand and you just reset the redstone contraption every so often, it's the kind of thing that you can do much more casually than growing the warped and crimson trees. And then you avoid the issue which the warped and crimson trees will eventually have of having to fill out a much broader, wider area of water. The open water is just not going to work out for this method at all. So I think we're going to continue with the sponge and sand method. Now I'm going to grab some scaffolding from wherever I've left that. I think probably in one of these shulker boxes somewhere. I've got a bunch of gravel and stuff that we could continue to use in place of the sand here since it's also affected by gravel. Gravity. But I think we're going to reclaim a lot of this sand as we did in the earlier portion of the time lapse. And all that really requires is for us to dive down here. I'm going to place scaffolding all the way up from the bottom because these areas are 4x4 four four, and so unlike a 3x3 three three area, it's not always guaranteed that placing the sponge is going to hit every single block. The sponge clears out a specific number of blocks drying them out completely, but it will sometimes leave like one there on the corner in an area like this, which is a 4x4. Four four. And if we place another sponge right here, then sometimes it will still leave that one piece of water dried out. So that's where we need to either put another sponge there or place a couple of sand blocks that will just fall on through and we'll collect those at the bottom if we need to. But I systematically go down the scaffolding, placing these sponges every so often and removing them as I go. And that way I avoid the tricky business of having to get the sponges from halfway up the wall on the way back. And it's nice and easy to just suck up any more water that is around here, place one more or two more sponges and I think we should be good with this column. And that way we've cleared out all of the scaffolding and everything as we go. We just need to put one more sand block there to clear out the final water source and everything is neatly packaged up for us to take back to the surface, probably using some fireworks. Of course, if you don't want to waste the fireworks, an easy alternative to that could be to break one sand block at the bottom of the column and have a single water source flow in from an adjacent site. 
Now comes the fun part, because if we drop down here and we place a torch underneath the sand pile here, <laughs> you can actually place them instantly if you hold down left and right click at the same time, or if you place it fast enough. But now if we remove both of these blocks, all of the sand is going to fall and break on the torches below it. And that way we can reclaim the sand as we go and continue to use it to box off more sections of water. So effectively, we are reclaiming areas of sand as we go instead of having to bring, you know, 10 plus shulker boxes of sand over here. I'm only using three or four and just recycling them step by step. And so at this point, I'm going to spend a bit of time drying out each of these individual 4x4 squares. We might kick back into a time lapse, or I might just do a little bit more of this on a live stream, because I have a live stream coming up that it makes sense to do some of this more grindy work on. And I'm hoping that we can get the remainder of this cleared out for this video. And there's definitely going to be some sections here where the warped and crimson trees are going to make it slightly faster to drain out that section. But I do think sand and boxing things off and clearing it out with sponges is going to be the way forward. Well, after all the optimism of that last clip, I'm sad to say that we didn't get this half of the monument all dried out. But we did get this half all done, and I'm very happy with this actually. It took longer than I expected just to clear out all of the sand to begin with, because gosh, that was a lot of sand. But once we've got into a rhythm of placing it all using those piston-assisted methods, this whole thing went by pretty quickly. We managed to get the remainder of this area cleared out within about a four hour live stream. And gosh, it feels weird seeing all of this prismarine still in the ocean monument form, but in the direct light of day without it being completely submerged in water. The interior of the monument still has a lot of water inside of it. If I ended up coming over here and breaking this down, you will see that yes, the interior is still flooded. And inside here, we will find more and more guardians as this process continues. But what we've got right here represents probably about seven or eight hours of work total. And I think I could probably get the last area done in maybe three or four hours. It's not going to take that long, especially considering that we've got a bunch of warped and crimson stuff growing over there that's going to make placing the sand a little bit easier because it doesn't have as far to fall. And the Guardians are having a fun little time in this unusual coral reef that they seem to have acquired over here, but I think we're probably going to do that in between episodes and then come back to this Guardian farm later in the week where we'll be able to take down the remainder of the monument, probably using a beacon and the conduit power and just blasting our way through all of this prismarine, and then we can start thinking about designs for our Guardian farm. We are also going to decorate the outside of this. I did see a couple of people worried that this was going to look really kind of homogenous and dull, and just like every other circular monument farm that you've seen, we are going to decorate this and make it look a little bit prettier. I have a couple of ideas already that I just want to draft, and they're not going to come in with the Guardian farm. That's probably going to take a little bit longer, but I do want to turn this into kind of a showpiece for the world, and one of the highlights of the series so far. So hopefully you folks are along for the ride. Thank you so much for watching this episode of the Minecraft Survival Guide. My name has been Pixlriffs. Don't forget to leave a like on this video if you enjoyed it. Subscribe to my channel if you want to see more, and I'll see you folks soon. Take care. Bye for now.